Frank Alley, how you doing, buddy? Good, Eric. Nice to meet you. Likewise, man. I was it was a pleasure to meet you last weekend, and uh, yeah, you were a trooper. You were you were out there in that freaking cold ass weather and rain. <laughs> and... It, it it was raw. You know, the first morning it wasn't awful. The afternoon was just completely terrible. Um, and then the next day it cleared up, but then, you know, everybody's leaving at that point, but that first day was pretty raw <laughs> and, and we were standing out there in it, but honestly, I like that event because I get to meet guys like yourself. You get to interact and, you know, you get to walk behind the line if you are to the line, if you want and go shoot something or do something that you couldn't do at SHOT Show. Right. You know, so I really like that that format myself. Uh, where, like you said, you, you go inside, you talk to the vendors. Uh, let's say voodoo voodoo rifles, for example, and you mm -hmm. say, "Man, I I've never shot a precision twenty two, right? It, it's kind of a it's a fairly neat thing for most." And you're like, "I've never shot a precision twenty two. I I want to go shoot one." Well, guess what? Walk over to the range and shoot one. And you're going to have somebody there that's going to explain to you how to use it, whatever, whatever you need. And, you know, make sure you're, you're, you enjoy it at its maximum. Absolutely. And then, you know, like even from the scope manufacturer side, you always get the people who will come online and go, you know, I want to look through it. I want to see the reticle in person. I want to, I want to compare it next to something else. And that allows you to do it because a lot of people put up those comparison bars and, you know, there's four or five different brands on a single mount that you can go through and look at in real time. And, you know, whether or not the person adjusts it for them is, is another story, but right. at least you get to go hands-on with things you normally wouldn't have access to. Right. So yeah, the PRS Expo, definitely a good, good, uh, good experience. Uh, obviously I got to meet you, so that was great, but I really like the whole interaction between customer vendor and obviously being able to put their hands on 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 the on the equipment get to test it and also the classes right uh you were teaching a class i was teaching a class uh uh Praslik was there teaching wind reading uh kestrel was there teaching about uh how to use a kestrel uh who else was there leopold had reticles um, and they were doing a reticle 101. You had the hands on with Kestrel, mine, Amos, and and then yourselves. Yeah. And then Bortek was teaching how to clean barrels. So there was a lot oh. going on. Yes, yes. And and you can look at that like the Bortek because the products are right there. I mean, it's funny because they sort of guilted me into cleaning a rifle <laughs> and I bought some stuff last year. So uh, so they, they they were like, dude, you really need to clean it. I'm like, all right, I'll clean it just for you. So it, it was one of those situations where i normally wouldn't have gone to Bortech and bought something and cleaned a rifle right but sitting there talking to him it's like yeah i'll go do that yeah and you know that's that's uh that's good that you uh they guilted you into it <laughs> 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 so so frank let's talk about your beginning man what what gets you into the rifle world um you know i was really a super fan back in the day uh, and that's what pushed me to the marine corps uh-huh So you have to go back with me in time to when I joined the Marine Corps, because that was the start of me getting down this journey. So I, I go to the Marine Corps and immediately I want to go to sniper school. And, and if people ever heard of the classes that I do with Mark Taylor, um, that I run around and do fundamentals classes and things in Alaska with Mark Taylor, Mark Taylor was my platoon sergeant in the Marine Corps. And we're still together working together today. So I go in the Marine Corps, I go to scout sniper school, graduate, deploy. Um, I deployed during the Iran-Iraq war. I happened to participate in the Operation Earnest Will and Praying Mantis. So in the middle of the 1980s, I get combat action. Mm -hmm. So that was something slightly unique for people growing up. Well, then I created Snipers Hide, right? So the internet starts. And there was two forums at the time. You had Sniper Paradise and then Sniper Country. And Sniper Country was just a threaded forum that would talk, you know, and, mm -hmm. the, and the conversation never stopped. Paradise was kind of like Sniper's Hide is. And then I started Sniper's Hide. Well, the other two forums sort of fell off the radar compared to me. 
And then I grew from there. And from that point, getting recruited down to rifles only, and you start teaching and start doing that, and, and it just never ends now. And I'm still excited about precision rifle shooting today, you know, because it goes all the way back to that 35 years ago, me being in the Marine Corps and up to today. And I'm still chasing it, r- driving down to Texas to do, you know, one hour class uh, just to have the fun of meeting new people and doing it. Man, I, I, um, that, that is one cool thing about you that you're still in it. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You don't have to. You no, don't have I, to be. I could sit home and do nothing and let the internet, you know, make its money and do all that stuff. But I love it. I yeah. still like chasing it, finding, you know, the the stuff and getting inspired by either new technology or getting inspired by just a, a new technique or a new dynamic of doing stuff. Because, you know, a, a lot of what we do isn't really different. But we're learning like capabilities. We're learning how to push limits and how to squeeze performance, precision, and accuracy out of equipment to the nth degree. And now you start adding in CNC machines. You add in tolerances that, you know, before we had to fight, you know, like yourself, you get with the precision reloading. You you can do a precise reloading job, but if you take a rifle 40 years ago, the rifle really wasn't up to it. But today, your rifle's up to the quality you can get. And now it's going to exploit that quality to the nth degree. And I like finding those lines. Well, that's one thing that I, I explained in my reloading class. And I was very clear to make sure that they understood that not every gun is a quarter minute gun, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's limitations on the equipment. And I told them, I said, look, this method that I'm going to teach you, it's going to, it's going to ring out the most, the most precision out of, out of your rifle. But that doesn't mean they're all going to be quarter. You know, that doesn't mean if you, if you hand load, you're automatically right. going to get a guaranteed quarter MOA or, or whatever you're looking for. Right. So like you said, there's tolerances, there's, there's equipment. And at some point, the equipment holds you back, but also knowledge, right? The, the, I, I call it software. Everybody mm-hmm. always wants to get hardware, 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 hardware. But software is something that needs to go with the hardware in order to be able to to uh, to to use it to its full potential, which is you know what you were doing at at, at you know at the PRS Expo. You were teaching the software, and I was right. too. Why we have firmware upgrades? Why we have software updates all the time? Right. You know, you may have the same piece of equipment here. But they're constantly updating that software, so that way there you're getting the maximum out of that equipment, and and you're absolutely right. And that's what we're trying to do is kind of give people that education to f- form their own opinions, make better buying decisions, because those better buying decisions push manufacturers to do better on their end. Because now the consumer's smarter, and you can't fool them anymore. Correct. That's for sure. So, how long ago did you start Sniper's Hide? 20 years uh, now, it would be actually November in 2000, 22 years would have been November of 2000 is when I bought the domain and when it was a page, it was a front page website in November of 2000. In May of 2001, it became what it is today, an active forum. I bought forum software several months later. And so May of 2001 would be its unofficial start, but the official start was November of 2000. What was the reason for starting Sniper's Hide? Um, actually, I got a divorce. Uh, I had nothing else to do. I was living in a new, you know, moved out, new house, this, divorced the wife, finalized everything. So we were talking online on a website called shooters.com. And we'd have 10 people on there talking and it would be fine. Well, as soon as you got 15 people on, the site would crash for two days. <laughs> and, and, you know, so it was like, well, wait a minute, we're trying to have conversations here. And there's actually a few original Snipers Hide members who came from shooters who were still active. But um, I started it because I saw a need where we were having a conversation the conversation kept being interrupted by, you know, a, a subpar forum. And then I just decided to build a better one. And that's really what happened. 
Supply and demand, right? Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, May is when I buy this software. September is when 9-11 happens. And Sniper's Hide is positioned to have, like, the best information out of all of that. And then right after that is when I go down and start working at Rifles Only. So I'm doing the government contracting three weeks on, one week off down in Texas. So I'm teaching, you know, uh, SF Rangers, SEALs, all those different units. Every month down at Rifles Only, I'm bringing the, the information that I can. I'm actually used to getting a lot of trouble because I would spill a lot of beans, man, on Sniper's Hide. Because I did. It's like, dude, we've been doing this for 100 years. You're not telling anybody anything different. But because I had a direct line from the internet and a civilian to what the military was doing that day, because I'm teaching them. And, you know, they're coming back from ops and, and, pre and post deployments and saying, we have a problem. We need to solve it. We would build the problem. I mean, maybe it's an alley and they can't figure out how to shoot somebody running across an alley. We'd build an alley. And so that kind of stuff people were well aware of. And then, you know, finally it gets to rifles only in itself is, which is where like PRS type precision tactical rifle shooting started he was doing these competitions in 1998. So he started Precision Rifle Competition. He recruited me to have the Sniper's Hide Cup down there. And so that three weeks on, one week off, well, one of those weeks was civilians in competitive shooting, but on a tactical level. Mm -hmm. We would take a mission that we heard about and turn it into a stage. And that's how PRS type shooting was supposed to have progressed. We would do long drawn out run and gun stages where you might be running for five minutes up and down berms around corners, you know, through windows, a culvert over here. It wasn't, you know, walk three feet, drop a bag on a parricade and shoot. You did military type stuff because we were training them. They were telling us about missions and we were recreating the missions as best we could as a competitive stage. And that's how we did it. And so we started that stuff at rifles only that turned into PRS. PRS was born on sniper's eye. Yeah, that's, that's crazy stuff. I mean, I, I, just to see how big PRS is nowadays, uh, it's massive. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, a, <laughs> but it, it, it is because the 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 type of the shooting we do is been termed PRS, but really it's fractured and we're all over the place. PRS, like, you know, as far as their their numbers go, their numbers actually aren't very big. If you take the people who try to qualify for the finale, mm -hmm. there's only like 300 people who try to qualify. But you can shoot a PRS match without being a member <clears throat> and without having to qualify. So that makes the numbers look very, very big because the people are going to the matches more than supporting a, a particular uh, type of series. Like out West where I live, I'm in Denver. There, there's no PRS hardly here at all. It's, you know, NRL Hunter, it's WICO. We do the Wyoming, Colorado league out here, which is gigantic for us. And even our one day local matches are covered by Wyoming, Colorado. So while we're doing a similar type of event, it's not affiliated back East. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you an active PRS shooter or you just, you just shoot for fun to these, you know, nowadays? Oh no, I've never been a member. Um, I've shot, you know, I, I ran them. I used to have, I was a match director because Sniper's Hide is the longest continuous match right now. Sniper's Hide has been going on since 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, next year is going to be 20 years for the Sniper's Hide Cup. Um, so my match has always been going on for years. I, today, I shoot under assumed names. I go to events and you'll look for my name and it won't be on the list. Uh, usually you got to find like a character from Goodfellas and you'll, you'll find <laughs> me. But I do shoot um, mainly because of the stuff that I'm doing with Chris Way. Mm -hmm. And I know you have interactions with Chris quite a bit, but um, him and I will go out locally here. We'll go to Cameo, shoot a match. We'll go to Pawnee, shoot a match. Uh, I've shot Guardians in Texas recently and other places. Um, 
but normally I go under a different name and, and then I just go to see, but I'm old and broken now, you know, I, I'm, I'm well over my fifties and my shoulders and necks don't work. My eyes are not the same. And so I'm a mid pack guy. I'm no longer a top 20. I mean, I fall in the top 20 when I get lucky, but I'm mainly a mid pack guy now. Yeah. Well, nothing wrong with that. I mean, um, it, it's one of those things that you're at the point that nothing needs to be proved, right? It's like, no, not at all. You, you, it, it's just there to keep me sharp. And, to, and so I can see what the up and coming people are doing. And then I can speak on it when I'm teaching people. You know, I want to be able to talk intelligent about it and be able to say, yeah, I went out there last week and did that. And I saw this work, this work and that not work. So, you know, I may have not lit the stage on fire, but I probably played with elements of what everyone's talking about during those stages just to see how it feels. Um, to see what my timings look like, what my hit percentages look like. Even if I only got, you know, maybe seven out of 10 hits because I go slow, but it's still giving me that that kind of feel for what's going on where if somebody comes up behind me who's 20 years younger than me, yeah, dude, you should go 10 for 10, you know, and this is how you should do it. And, and in that stage, I just happen to go a lot slower because I'm analyzing a lot of that stuff too, you know, trying to figure out, you know, oh, okay, that felt weird. How can I make that feel different? You know, and and you know those kind of things. So these classes that you teach, what what's uh, tell me about that? Um, I'm now doing two, but originally I came out of rifles only, and rifles only's classes were at the time six days long. We did a combo, a PR one and two combo. Rifles only to Mike, you know, which I love was a heavy fundamentals location. Like they taught fundamentals first, you know, tips and tricks later. And the Marine Corps is a fundamental driven organization for marksmanship. Every Marine's a rifleman. You know, we do our two weeks on the rifle range in boot camp and all that. And, and so for us, marksmanship is key. Like right now, even the army is more into a tips and tricks because they they feel that's better for a larger amount of people where we're still fundamental driven. So my classes for me, I have two kinds. I have a basic sniper's hide class, like a three-day class that I do here. And that is heavy fundamentals on the first day, a process of gathering data using the weaponized math and, and the stuff we've come up with on the second day. And then on the third day, we go into kind of like your PRS type tips and tricks, barricades off your belly intro. So I'm showing you where that goes. I'll put you on the clock. Uh, with that, when I talk about Mark Taylor, Mark was my platoon sergeant, lives in Alaska. For eight years, I've been going to Alaska. And I have over 800 students in just Alaska. And up there, we do a two-day fundamental class. Um, Alaskans are a different breed of shooter, more in the hunting practical. I'm going to go out and, you know, kill dinosaurs to eat and live. And then I'm going to go home and, and butcher them up and do everything I have to do. So they don't run electronics. They don't screw around with a lot of stuff. So their mindset is infinitely different than what they call the people here in the lower 48. So I do classes with Mark. And now we've reached a saturation point in Alaska. We've taken it on the road. I have my range here in Colorado and Fort Morgan, which uh, like uh, which I'm going to get to weigh in a minute, which we're working on and building up. Now I've, I've taken it from mile high. Mile high shooting used to have the range and I've taken it over. And so we're building it up to make it a, a laboratory. And the laboratory is because of Chris Way. So... Mark Taylor and I do these fundamental classes and we travel all across the country and we'll go to your range. We'll do a two, three day class, whatever you require back here in Colorado in my backyard, I have a shooter called Chris way. And Chris is a competitive animal. He shoots multiple disciplines. He's a go ruck mountain climber hanging upside down from an overhead ledge, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he has a scientific mind and method. And he wants to know why that happened to everything. <laughs> I 
I mean, you're right. You yeah. talk to him. It sounds Am like, it sounds like a, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's, uh, some of us are like that. Yeah. So Chris is in now in my backyard and I meet Chris and he's doing things different than other people. He's, he's kind of cutting to the chase with training. He's not doing the guided tour that a lot of like winning PRS guys will do. You know, winning PRS guys will do well at a match, and then people will say, I want to do as well as you. They don't know why they did well. Usually it's practice and dedication. It's not anything special. But they go, okay, come to my range, and I'll show you what my training is. And they go, all right, I can't do what you just did, but how do I do it? I don't know. This just works for me. I do it this way. And then they say, there's the target. Just keep practicing till you get it. And they tour, you know, it's a tour, you know, here's the, here's the stage. There's the target. Keep working the stage till you can hit that target on command. Well, we analyze and Chris wants to analyze and I'm looking at recoil pulses. I'm looking at the movement of your rifle. I'm filming you in slow motion every chance I can get to see the direction and how far and how much your rifle is actually moving in your hand moving from your belly to a tripod or a barricade or something. So I run into Chris. I start seeing this stuff and we start doing this little bitty works together. Um, Chris has a, a, a program called rifle craft and he works um, multiple positions with a tripod where you do his rifle craft drill. And it tells you uh, basically what kind of overall shooter you are not just a prone quarter minute shooter. What do you do sitting, kneeling, standing prone on the clock, deploying the tripods and then shooting the target. And most people find they're closer to four minute shooters when you do Chris's thing. Mm -hmm. um, Chris's goal is to be a one minute shooter under his conditions. It's hard. You know what I mean? What he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so we start working that and everybody from our standpoint, the instructors like myself, you got like Phil and Kalen, the modern day guys, you got Chris and Chris, the CR2 guys, and you know, myself and, and there's uh Brian Whalen out here is another one. So there's a lot of us instructors, the rifles only crew and the people that are doing comp stuff. We're looking at this and people want to do comp things. And the easiest way to teach competition is to, again, shoot the stage. Well, I come in and I always start analyzing the fundamentals because I'm seeing a disconnect. When they're gathering their data to dope their rifle, their shooter A. Uh -huh. When they're doing their stuff, their shooter B. And things don't connect as well anymore they miss targets over the top they're pulling off the side they're going too fast they're doing different things and that's where i start working with chris and chris now is developing a program a product around his rifle craft and he's doing it on my range and as i look at the people he's bringing in uh, it's like now nah, that's not going to work look what he's doing right there and he starts noticing that i'm seeing things from across the range like, oh, dude, that ain't going to happen. Look what he just did. Well, what do you mean what he just did? Look right there. He just did it again. And it's because that's the stuff I key in. Uh -huh. But he goes, well, we need you to do this before because he's telling students show up like you're going to a match. Uh -huh. You should be ready. Your dope should be ready. And he was saying, here's the clock. Buzzer goes off. Go. And the problem was people weren't hitting stuff which is why they came to class because they weren't right. competition either. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But then we sense. find out that it's the process. People look at gathering dope as an event. It's not an event. It's a process, right? You don't, you don't basically you know, work up for your loads and do everything at one time. You're not done once. Mm -mm. You have a process you go through. You fine-tune it. And then once it's fine tuned, now you're monitoring it because it may change as you go down the road. So you have a process that you look at. Well, a lot of these guys don't. They just knock this event out because they're working 
They want to go on the weekend and shoot a comp. And the event is done. They get to the comp and to go execute the, uh, that uh, during the competition, the wheels fall off. And they don't know where it fell off because in their mind, they did everything they saw in the videos. They did everything they read online. Why did it fall off? Well, normally it's the foundation. Their foundation was lacking and it's a disconnect from where they are here to where they want to be during the event, the, the, the match. And now we need to link those two things together. And that's where the better shooters are. The better shooter is the guy whose practice more purposely matches their execution during a match. Yeah. And, and uh, just from talking to some of the better shooters, uh, they have a process, like you said, but they also have fail safe uh, things that, you know, for example, if a Mac fails, this needs to be done. Yes. They practice, they practice failures. They practice everything. Right. And when it happens, it's just part of the process. Just, just, take care of it and keep on moving right absolutely and and we learned that like rifles only used to have a 300 yard long live fire obstacle course we built it wow and it was amazing and the problem we saw the first time because for safety when you climbed up your your obstacle on this this was a big jungle gym it was made out of culverts and concrete mm -hmm. we went to a concrete place all their like not spec concrete stuff we sh we brought and, mm -hmm. and we brought it down and built a jungle gym and it's 300 yards long mag out bolt back now you shoot then it's mag out bolt back run to the next part scramble through and all that well we found people couldn't change magazines in their bolt gun everybody practiced mag reloads in their handgun and carbine but nobody practices their bolt gun but it still has a magazine right you know so even if you go on my youtube channel i have failure drills with a bolt gun with a magazine double feeds and stuff and there's an instructional video on my youtube channel with a mag failure and that's one of those things, exactly like you said, the better shooters recognize. I mean, you can run up to a stage, and if you have an, an AW type cup magazine, the double stack AW mags, and if you run up to that stage and insert that mag and bang the bottom, those rounds are going to come out the top. And, and it's like, oh, shoot, I banged <laughs> the bottom of my magazine too hard, and I knocked all my rounds out of the top, so I better have my bolt closed, at least up but closed, right. when the mag goes in. So when I seat it, Hold some in place. I don't knock the rounds out of the ejection port. Right. And and so little things like that is stuff we have to look at. At what point should, a, a, you know, let's say a new shooter worry about stuff like that? I mean, if you had to lay out a progression, it's like, okay, the first thing you need to work, work on is this. They probably... They probably don't need to be worried about mag changes or mag failures until they take care of all the basics, correct? Correct. Correct. You have to put things in context. You have to recognize, you know, what's more important, a high priority and a low priority for you. You know, absolutely. I mean, if if you can't get to a barricade, put your bag down and get that first shot off in, in with a newer person in, say, 15 seconds, which is slow, if you can't do that, I shouldn't be expecting you to play with your magazine and understand that when you get down to the 10 second mark. And now you can walk up to that barricade, drop your bag and your first shot is getting off in that 10 second mark. Now start thinking about your magazine because you're moving fast now. And as your speed increases, that's where the potential for the errors will increase. Right. I, I always talk about it. It's, it's like a funnel, right? Mm -hmm. at, at first you're going to have a lot to work on. And the more you perfect what, you know, your craft, the less it's going to seem like you're working on smaller stuff, but it's just as important, right? And the essence of making Absolutely. everything as perfect as you can. No, that, and, and that's what we, and, you know, it's part of like why people come to me for my class, because I've boiled down my class so efficiently. I mean, we're building clones in the first day. We have some things that we've learned over the years that just move so fast compared to other people. 
and that we can focus on them. And then we're, we're off that subject. I can get you lined up. I can get you set up the way we need you to be. And then we're gone from that subject. And I don't have to necessarily revisit it because I'm giving you these sort of, it's, I don't want to call them shortcuts, but they're, the, they're, um, they're essential. You're just doing the essentials. There's no wasted movement. And we don't have to worry about that. And if you're a fidgeter behind the rifle, you're fit, you know, we're going to fix that. Um, because that's the problem, right? People hunting and fidgeting behind mm -hmm. the rifle, mm -hmm. trying to get comfy. We'll recognize that right up front and, and start moving things around so you stop fidgeting. And, and, and that's, that's one of the keys of, 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 you know, even something so basic it's, I call it, uh, it's your car rifle setup is your car. If, if you have some, so, you know, if somebody went outside right now or not outside, but downstairs to my car and moved the seat or mirror, I would immediately know and my relationship with my rifle needs to be that way. Where if, if my stock moved, if I'm on a chassis or something, I better know. And I could feel that. The way I turn my my like with the AIs and my book that's kind of behind me, um, oh, fell again. Um, with the AIs, I turn my um my butt plates upside down and angle them, because when I address that rifle, I can feel it. And if that moved or somebody touched it, you know, looking at it, I feel it. And it's it's the same as my seat or mirror in a car. My 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 scope is my mirrors. My stock is my seat. And the bolt is my steering wheel. And I look at those things that way. And I want that same amount of comfort behind my rifle as I have with my car. Makes absolute sense. Uh, what kind of, you know, I, I get this a lot uh, and I'm sure you do as well. What, what kind of, how small of groups do they need to be shooting before they take a class like yours? Because everybody always, they all get, they always, well, there's multiple types of people, but the people that I talk to, they always tend to get stuck in the in the tuning the rifle phase, and they seem to never move on to anything else. And, and I tell them, you know, maybe maybe it's the shooter at, you know, sometimes yeah. it's the shooter that's holding the whole thing back. So you kind of have to do a balanced uh, progression, you know, hardware Honestly, and software. I'm a basic guy. I'm a I'm a day one class. Mm -hmm. Now, not the Chris Way stuff that we're doing. The Riflecraft USA is an advanced class. But the Frank Sniper's Hide, Mark Taylor, our classes, if you were shooting 3M away at 100 yards with a rifle you just bought, come to my class. Perfect. I'll get you below a minute. You know what I mean? All I right. don't care. What, you, you, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at all of it in totality. Hey, man, I bought this rifle. I mean, they could have bought a Tika, you know, T3X. Factory Hornet A ammunition. They bought a Vortex PSD. They put it on it, and they found they're shooting 3M away. And they don't think that's right, and it's not. Come to my class. That's the perfect setup. Come to me. I will get you spun up, and you will you will be dancing with that rifle when you leave, and you will understand from you know uh, the the crown all the way back to you what's going on with that when you're done. Correct, and that's really the best thing right because they, they really don't know what's causing the 3moa right and that's a terrible place to be because more likely they're going to spend a ton of money trying to get this rifle to shoot better when in reality it may, it may not be the rifle it may be just like you said earlier it may be an adjustment that just needs to be made it, it maybe the rifle just this simply doesn't fit them and it's going to require someone like you to look at the whole thing like you said you video you do whatever and say ah here's the problem Smile, yep. tweak, and they're good to go. No, absolutely, and 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 that's what we do: is we correct problems, we diagnose issues, we see where things are falling apart, and we tighten them up, and make sure. I mean, the first thing in my class, like what you do, so you show up to my class, you've never been to class before, nothing like that, and I give you a safety brief, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, welcome to the class. I'm Mark and Frank. Here we go, safety brief. Then the next slide after the objectives, you know, we're going to teach you these things in class. The next slide is show me. So you're going to pick up without any instruction and you're going to bring your rifle rear bag and five rounds. And I have a fundamental checklist, 20 point checklist. It's a prescription we use. And you lay down by yourself like there's two guys on the line, but we shoot them one at a time. I'm on one side, Mark's on the other. 
before you even put a round in your rifle, we're writing down. And we're looking at how you got behind the rifle, how you address this situation. And then you're shooting a five shot group and we're breaking that down to 20 points when it's over. And then we're saying nothing. We don't talk to you. And we're, you know, we'll make a joke if somebody's doing something silly, <laughs> we'll start cracking up because we call it the humbler. It kind of humbles people. Mm -hmm. Well, then when we're done, we peel that sheet off and we give it to you. Then when you come to my class, like, Two minutes later, it takes about 45 minutes for a typical class. So that's the first drill we do first thing in the morning. Now you come to classroom and I'm going to reference the sheet and I've seen you shoot already. So I'm going to go, Eric, trigger control. You did this. You slapped the trigger over here. You didn't follow through. Bob, over here, you crushed the trigger and you're trying to drive it through the stock. And I've seen it already. So when I'm talking in the class, I can point to you and say, I saw you do this. You were holding your breath for three shots. You took a giant gulp on your fourth shot. And then on your fifth one, you actually breathe normal. You know what I mean? I can see that. And, and when I'm explaining the fundamentals of marksmanship, I can say, this was your point of error. Then you're going to look at the sheet and go, yeah, you wrote it down right here. This was my problem. And so now you're referencing the error I've referenced on your sheet to me explaining how to fix it. And then we go out, we pull every scope off of every rifle that doesn't have hunting rings okay so if you have a pick rail and your rifles and rings on a pick rail we pull every scope i have a 30 pound fixture that we designed and carry with us you put your scope on a 30 pound fixture we have a tall target that's made for us at 100 yards we use a laser it's 300 feet and we check your scope to make sure it's going to adjust the 10 mils that we'll normally need. And we look at a couple things. One, if I have a 12 person class, three to four people, their scope is canted in their rings when they mounted it. So we're fixing that because I, I can't see it unless I pull your scope. Mm -hmm. But now I see your reticles canted. I'm right there. I'm going to fix it. Then we're going to dial the scope and we're going to check it and make sure it moves and we don't have anything crazy hiccups. Now, we used to check and test every scope and publish the results. Well, manufacturers didn't like the point two here and the point two there and they started yelling at me. Uh -huh. so now we just make sure it's going to work. <laughs> and we'll tell you what your number is so you can go in software and fix it. But most people aren't more than point two at 10 mils off, which is very small. So finally, what we do then is we show you parallax. This is parallax on your scope resolved. It's stuck to the target. Do you see the reticle stuck to the target? Yes. Move your head. Is it stuck to the target? Yes, it is. Now we're going to take your parallax knob and move it out of whack. Now do you see it moving all over the target? Yes, I do. I see it moving all over. Now you fix it. He fixes it. Then we check their work. Then they come to me from there. They're with Mark at that point. They come to me. Now I take their scope. I get them on their rifle and I set it up and I get their arm and or their, their uh, length of pull. I make sure everything's good that I can adjust and make sure what I can adjust. I do adjust. I get you behind the rifle and you're laying behind your rifle with no scope on it. Mm-hmm. Are you comfortable? How does that feel? Run the bolt. How's that trigger? Is your is your wrist straight or are your wrist cocked? Is what's going on? How's your height? Because prone isn't as low as you can get. Prone is as low that you need for your body type. So that may mean your bipod is three notches up. My bipod's only one notch up because that's the height for me and you for prone. <laughs> I do that. Then I put the scope on. How does that look? I look at what you do. Are you hunting for it or are you right there? Then I move it back. How's that? A little better, a little worse. Then I move it forward. How's that? A little better, a little worse. This looks like the right spot right here for you. Let's lock it down. I shoot them at 100 just to make sure they're close and they, I don't have a cheese looking, you know, Swiss cheese board. Okay, you're ready. Stand by. Just relax. Once we get everybody set up like that, then the class starts. And that's my first day, first hour on the line. I'm doing all that stuff with people. Well, yeah, you're making sure the equipment is set up properly. Otherwise, yeah. you're, you're, you know, again, back to the, they think it's them when in reality it's just the equipment. And, and people are amazed to watch, like when we do our in evals, we never watch the target. 
Like even our final leave out before you leave, we do a big deal final one and we talk to everybody. We demonstrate, we show, we want you to go home looking like you've been to class. You know what I mean? Yeah, Cause yeah. you're representing me now and don't go there looking sloppy, dude. I want you to look. So people are always like, what target do I shoot? Dude, I don't care what target you shoot, shoot the target you think you're going to hit, but I'm watching you. Cause if, I did my job. It doesn't matter what target you're going to shoot. You're going to hit it. I don't worry about that. You know, you're shooting that 600 yard target. You know, you got this mile an hour wind going on. We've already talked about it. You've already been hitting it. So now just execute and let's make sure you're doing it right. But I'm watching you, not the plate. Cause I'll hear it when it hits going to ring in my ears. And yeah, dude, you got it. You got three for three, you know, meanwhile, we're working on you. And it hits a come. Yeah, that's the, you know, most people, when they go to the range, right, they bring a buddy with them. And the buddy's the one on the spotting scope, right? Yeah. That, that's how usually how they how they interact. But nobody's watching the shooter actually shoot and exactly. correcting. Just touch steel. I mean, that's the, the, that's the downside where sort of there's a disconnect. Now, I don't follow a lot of the kind of weird dramas that happen between disciplines lately. I haven't been that deep, but I know – you're on more of a precise level than say the PRS guys might be. Now they think they're on a precise level, but you're on a more precise level. And all they have to do is touch steel. And that makes you sloppy because you have a clock and their clock is fast. There is no way you're going to be as precise as a guy with a 20 minute time limit with a paper X ring as you are touching a two MOA plate of steel, you know, from a jungle gym on a bag in 90 seconds, you're going to be sloppy. And while I know your gun is a belly bench rest capable gun and in the prone, you're going to be every bit as accurate. If you were shooting that paper target with Eric, but guess what? That's not your discipline. And while you'll do really, really, really well with it, that we're a bit sloppy and there's, and there's competition scars. I have training scars. I'm slow and analyze things because I'm analyzing it for training. So that takes my timings way off, you know? So I see comp scars where those guys are too fast and they'll peel off and pull off the gun. Their head's moving and their hands moving before the bullet's gone. Cause they're trying to race the clock. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And so everything has to be put in its context. That's very important that, that you mentioned that because it's a different game. I'm going to call it a game because uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they are absolutely games, right? Absolutely the game. Uh, you know, the F-Class game that I play, absolutely, it's different. It's different. We're, you know, we have more time. It's a smaller target. You know, we, we, we're trying to really pick our way through the wind, all that, right, all of the above. I have also shot PRS. And by the way, my first PRS match, PRS match ever was at Rifles Only. So I'm well nice. aware about the pull mag both back and mm -hmm. move, right? But it's a totally different game. Uh, the I realized that tuning a rifle for PRS, at least for me, is way easier because I don't have to have the the quarter MOA or the the tip bullets or the sorted bullets or the turn brass or any of that 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 is almost required in F class because we have such a small target, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I I really realized that. What I was really lacking on was fundamentals. Like, I, you lay me prone, I'm pretty much going to hit anything. The minute, and but they're not all prone, right? The minute you made me shoot off a barricade, it didn't matter how close, how 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 good I was clustering the shots in the middle of the target. Because once I go to the barricade, or once I do a troop line, or any of that, it's it's out the window, right? Yep. And now my score is is crap from there on you know and you have to relearn trigger for that because of that light trigger you're running if i mean prs people run those light triggers i'm not a big fan of it i really think like the minimum should be around the 12 ounce mark and not that eight and four that they go for but you can go down to a two ounce trigger if you want and probably do uh, you probably shoot next to two ounce triggers all the time right if you pick that rifle up and now want to slam it on a barricade and move around with it, the last thing you want is to run that bolt too fast and too hard with a two ounce trigger. Right. So you have to sort of relearn how to engage that trigger under the clock when it's light on a 
wobbly position. And that's where the end, I mean, there was a time in PRS where they were like letting NDs go because they were NDing so much. Hmm. And it was like, guys, what are you doing? This dude's torching rounds off because you're letting them have eight ounce triggers and you're not doing any, you're, you're, you're making the rule where if it hits the berm, it's legal. If it launches over, it's not, where did it launch over? You know, cause, and that was a bad time for PRS in my mind. And it took a while for people to understand the safety in the movement. It's why combat triggers. I shoot AI rifles. I have two stage triggers for a reason. I want to come up married to that trigger and then hit my wall and change my mind, you know? So that's why two stage triggers for me are like bread and butter. I'm living on a two stage trigger all day and the more accurate, you know, the trigger does affect that accuracy that way. And if people are moving around on a trigger, there's a huge potential. They're moving the gun off target. And so that's why you have to kind of find that balance point with a, with a trigger in, in the PRS game versus, and, but like you're saying too, it's kind of how you and I got in the conversation because people were leaving my class and telling you what I was doing with my Valkyrie load and going to your class and precision reloading and saying, Frank's not doing that because I don't need to. <laughs> right. Right. Well, they, they were, they were saying, you know, Frank, he just picks a speed and, Use a tuner the rest of the way, and that's and yeah. I said and I said and I do that for PRS nowadays. Well, yeah. all right, let me be a little bit more specific about that. You do that because now you know the cartridge, so you know where it shoots, right? Right. I'm sure right. you didn't do that the very first time you picked up a Valkyrie. You said, "Oh, I'm going to pick X speed." I'm sure, and I don't know. You 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 played with it some, and then you go, "Okay, this is where it shoots," and now I'm done. This is all I'm going to do going forward. Right. Well, I'm a factory ammo guy because, you know, my reloader for years, I, I have a, a good reloading setup and all that, but I travel, I move, I train and teach and I go through so much ammo. I don't want to come home and reload. So mm -hmm. I'm factory ammo. Well, I get the Valkyrie and first I work the Valkyrie in the gas gun with JP. So I have a JP Valkyrie. I actually shot a Guardian with it when it first came out and the 88s had just dropped the same week. I shot the Guardian and I came in 12th with a gas gun Valkyrie in a Guardian match. Mm -hmm. Well, then everybody's having the problems. The Valkyrie don't work. The Valkyrie don't work, but I'm having decent luck. Mm -hmm. Well, because of my resources, I, I'm like, I like this Valkyrie. It's light. It's small. It fits Frank really well. And nobody really likes it. And I get it. But I buy a big horn action and big horn has the float and bolt heads. And I get the six, eight bolt face and I build a Valkyrie bolt gun. I get a Bartland left-hand gain twist barrel. The left-hand gain twist barrel solves any of the ammo problems and reamer problems people had. And I'm shooting the factory 90 grain ammo that Federal's putting out. Here's the problem with the Valkyrie. 2750. That's how fast the Valkyrie's going, 2750, because the gas guns. So now I'm using it and using it, and I really like it. I can go to Alaska. I can get American Eagle 75-grain Valkyrie ammo for $8 a box. Mm -hmm. Shoot it to 500 yards on a demo and look like a hero. <laughs> and no recoil, no nothing, no wear and tear on my guns, and go home and do what I have to. I mean, I even shot the Valkyrie to 2,100 yards with Brian Whalen. Mm -hmm. Now it's dead and nobody wants to deal with it. And there's a small little group on Sniper's Hide shooting bolt guns. And I said, you know, guys, here's the problem. It's too slow. I want speed. I'm a speed guy. I want speed. And right then, what's what just peeks its head out of the ground? 22 Creedmoor. 22 Creedmoor starts to show. And I run into guys with 22 Creedmoors. And they're shooting like 90 grain bullets at like 3,200 feet per second. And they love it. And they're like, laser beam, laser beam, laser beam. And I'm like, man, I'm 2750. So now I'm like, man, if we can get the Valkyrie up in speed with case or whatever, blend the powder, do something, maybe it'll be better. 
So I start talking to people. We start playing around a little bit. Well, recently I go and teach a class in Pennsylvania. Student comes up to me. He goes, Frank, I got the load. He goes, I got my Valkyrie bolt gun MPA. I have a burger 85.5 grain load, 28 grains of CFE 223. I'm a 1.6 overall to the Ojibwe. And I'm 29.50. I said, you're 29.50, dude? He's like, yes. I said, give me that. And he so for six days, he gave me his gun and ammo. I'm teaching six days worth of classes. I'm shooting it every day to 1,000 yards in Pennsylvania at sea level at Mifflin there. This gun's hammering. I got a guy getting ready to shoot the Ed Land sniper competition, mm -hmm. and he's got his game gun. He's got an Alchemedes, you know, Nucleus. He's got a 6.5 Creedmoor load that's tuned. This kid does not miss a single target all weekend. I'm one-tenth off of him with this Valkyrie load. And I'm keeping pace with his game gun. Mm -hmm. So I said to Kevin, I said, Kevin, I want to buy your gun. But really, I just <laughs> want your ammo. <laughs> so I go home. I pull my reloading stuff out. I get it all set up. I'm in a new house, and I hadn't set my stuff up. So I set my reloading stuff up. And um, I pull my Valkyrie stuff out. And I'm just using once-fired brass. Because I clean up on my range, I throw all the brass and buckets and stuff. So I'm just scooping one's fire brass out. I'm sizing it, cleaning it up, you know, nothing crazy. I didn't even have to size it. I, mm. I take that. I really didn't size it. I, I cleaned it. I deprimed it, did everything. I do my uh, primer pockets and I do my flash holes. Make sure that's nice. And then I start playing with the load. I put the 28 grains of CFE in and one six is short to me. And I'm like, damn, one six is like a gas gun load. I'm going longer. So I did one seven, then I did one seven three oh, then I one did one seven six, then I did one seven nine five, and I did the loads that way. Mm -hmm. Well, 28 was going 3,200 feet per second here with my gun. I was like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> so I bat, I'm like, holy cow, man, this is going nuts. So I redo the load. I go home that day, I redo the load, and I I just I just flipped the coin and said 27.5. Let's see what that does. Mm -hmm. so I do 27.5. I do my my couple uh, seating depths, and I just drop 10 rounds uh, for each seating depth, and I do it. I go out there, and I run 10 rounds for each one, and I'm right at 3,000 feet per second. And the best group that I had, because we were talking group size, for mm -hmm. me— I'm a three eights guy. If I hit three eights, I'm happy. Three mm -hmm. eights is my happy number. So I want to say the uh, 1.795 hit me right around three quarters of an inch. Maybe it'll five eights. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, boom, what's the number say? I got an SD of five and I'm 3025. Done. <laughs> so I'm like, so now I start loading it up, loading it up, and I'm out there with Chris Way and shooting it, and I'm hitting all the targets. And he's like, wow, that's looking really good, dude. I said, yeah, it's a little bit off. So then he starts, we start talking tuners, him and I, because he's mm -hmm. running your tuners. And um, like the only reason I wasn't at the time was running your tuner, uh, was you had the ones you blended into the barrel more right. so than the externals. Right. So I had an external here and mm -hmm. so, and I'm running cans. I have my suppressor on it. So I have an external that I can run my suppressor on. So Chris and I start talking. We're like, Hey man, let's start collecting up our tuners. Cause we have multiple ones. I have mm -hmm. an insight. He's got this, he's got that other guy that looks almost insighty. Um, I don't remember their name. He's got yours. He's got one that'll self time from you. And then I have mine. And, um, He's like, just, just pop it on without changing any settings and see what it does. Just put it on zero. Mm -hmm. Pop the tuner on to zero, and it tightened the group up, up to half minute. It already sucked it in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not even going to do anything. I'm leaving it. So then the expo comes up, and I only – but I'm still going to go out and fine-tune the accuracy with the tuner. Mm -hmm. But I'm – a 85 grain, 85, five burger with, I have Starline brass ammo and I have federal factory ammo that I've reloaded. Mm -hmm. 
I got 27 and a half grains. I'm 1.795 overall. I'm 6.9 mils to a thousand yards. Damn, that's I'm, flat. Yeah, I'm 30, 25. I'm a seven mile an hour gun to 600 yards. Uh huh. So it's like a perfect, you know, steel gun because all I have to do is touch it. And there's it, no recoil, right? It's like none, no recoil none at yeah. all. It doesn't move. And, and, you know, if I do lose a primer pocket or I lose a piece of brass, who cares? Yeah. yeah. It's Valkyrie. Yeah, that's six nine. That's flat, man. Yeah. I mean, I was at there at the expo. I had Emil shot it because we were talking and Emil works for Berger. And I said, you know, I got this load and it's working really well and these things are going on. He goes, really? You're doing that? I said, yeah, <laughs> come on, I'll shoot it. Well, sat on Sunday, he came out to the line. I was 2-2 two -two on the 500-yard target there. So I'm hitting those 500-yard plates. It's center punch and you do your wind right and all that. It's going to, you know, suck them into the group. The, the only thing I noticed with my load I have to clean up, and I did clean it up with the tuner, is I had some vertical. I had mm -hmm. vertical spread in it, and the tuner cleaned it up and made it more round than vertical, and that's what it did. It cleaned me up vertically. But at 600, I had about a three, four-inch vertical spread on the original load. Yeah, that, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, I'll take it. You know, and, and, and like I said, I just knock them out now. And then um, Way had bought components for Valkyrie gas gun. He's not using it and shooting it, so I bought all his – I bought 600 rounds of Starline brass that's already sized and primed that he put together. Uh -huh. So now I just scoop. I have a big plastic bin that's ready. I just scoop into that. I, I load up my loading block. I drop my powder, drop my friggin' pill, and I'm done because the brass and the primer's already ready to go. Keep it simple, right? Yeah. What more do I need? It's I'm, I'm happy. And I shoot prairie dogs at 1,000 yards with it. I, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the people that took my class, uh, they were probably surprised by how I talked about, you, you got to have fun. Quit quit getting stuck in the tuning st stage for the life of the barrel. At yeah. some point, you're just going to go shoot, and you're going to realize that it's better than you than you imagine, right? Because uh, online, you, you read a lot of like, oh, this is a quarter-minute gun all day long if I do my part. And, and I tell <laughs> them, you know what? Sometimes that's just a gun that shot a quarter minute one time, but now you read that and now you have that expectation that your rifle needs to do that all the time. At some point, like, like you just said, ah, half a boy, fine. And you just go shoot. And yeah. now you're excited about it. Right. Yeah. Cause it's better than factory. You right. know what I mean? I, I'm going to get a half minute out of a factory load anyway. Then I'm like today, Hornaday's SDs are in the high twenties. You know, two years ago, Hornaday's SDs were 12. I'll leave with 12. I'm fine shooting 12 factory ammo all day, but do I want to shoot 28? No, I don't want to shoot one with an SD of 28. But if I make that load and I got my speed where I want, because like I said, I'm a speed hound. I want <laughs> speed. I Well, I think there's there's places where you need to be. Like 6.5 Creedmoor for most, most people are right around that 27.50. Mm -hmm. If they look at their factory, what a, what a heavier 140 grain, some variant of 140s. They run around 2750, maybe if they got a long barrel. Now I'm talking factory. If they hand load it, of course, many will go faster. But they're in that 2750. Well, anywhere from like 25 to 2750, the bullets will all perform pretty similar. But they're not doing you any favors. You're not maximizing that bullet at 2750. 2850 is the break point. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to the next node up to that 2850, now your bullet is going to do stuff it's supposed to be doing. And how I stumbled on this is software, just like you said. So the Valkyrie, ever people always play with like um, tracks in their software. They'll get the, you know, the 600 to work, but then the eight and the thousand don't line up. They'll get the eight and the thousand to work, but the four and five are funky and they don't work. That's because you're in the wrong speed node for that bullet. If you speed it up, your track will work perfect. Mm. And so I want to be in speed nodes that I think like, like I said, that big one for me, the change is 2850. 
So if you're not up to a, a great example, I talk about on my podcast, I can, you might relate to this. 338 mm-hmm. dead right now. Nobody cares anything about a 338. Right. What killed the 338 was the 300 grain bullet going 2750. Everybody with a 338 who bought the 300 grain bullets, 2750. That's the wrong node for that bullet. It doesn't work at 2750. Now, if you shoot to a thousand yards, looks great. If you shoot to a mile, not so much. Take that same gun and that same shot you did at a mile with that 300 grain bullet at 2750. Put it in, put a 250 in, go in 3050, predictability, 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 all the way out. Less drift, less drop, and you're going to hit better. But everybody said the 338 had to have the 300 grain bullet. The 300 grain bullet was going too slow, and it killed the 338. That no, Now everybody wants the Norma, 300 grain Norma. Or the yeah, the 300 norma rather, not 300 grain, but 300 norma. Right. Or shoot two fifteens. It's a 338 bolt face. It's a 338 neck down to 30 cal, and they're shooting a 215. But if they take the same case, they put a 300 grain bullet in it out of the 338. Now they'll crow about the norma and hate on the 338. <laughs> but you 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 basically turned the 338 into a bus. You get you made it a VW bus instead of a Porsche. I want a Porsche. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Give me a Porsche, dude. I don't want a VW bus. Well, can I get there and do what I need to do with a bus? Yes, I can. Well, in certain locations, the heavier floating bullet with less wind buck better. Yes, it will. But come out west here. The six millimeter doesn't work as well as the six five because I have wind. You know, well, now I want a 250. It's the reason in F class we shoot seven millimeters or thirties, right? Because we yeah. shoot for score, right? They buck the wind better. Yeah, and they're faster because you guys are down a little bit, and the sevens are great because they go really fast. I have the wisdom, mm-hmm. and I'm doing a one seventy five at twenty nine hundred. And when we used to shoot alongside the other guys, they would do the one eighty at thirty fifty. You get a seven at thirty fifty on a on a on a um, one eighty grain bullet. I think smoking. You yeah. go to two thousand yards, no problem. Yeah, we don't we don't go that fast. We keep them around twenty eight to three thousand, somewhere in there, right? Well, barrel life recoil, yeah, yeah. They, all the, that, yeah, stuff. all that because we don't yeah. get to use muscle brakes, yeah. so yeah. all well, that exactly. enters into the equation, right? But exactly, uh, yeah, seven millimeters, twenty, you know, twenty eight hundred to twenty nine fifty. It's yeah, that's a that's a killer bullet. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, but that's why everybody cha- wants like the 708, but nobody has executed a 708 is because they tend to go just a little bit heavier than is practical. But we don't have like a really great lighter seven bullet that somebody would be able to put into a seven millimeter 08. Right. You know, there's not like a 135 that's like a really nice one or a 145. You make a nice 145 and put that in a seven millimeter 08. Then you would have seen people using the seven millimeter 08, but we don't have that bullet. And, and you know, now you, you see like the six GT I have here and the GTs to me are really efficient. Well, if I can make my Valkyrie match a, a, a 22 GT, cheaper brass, less, it's, it's less work. That's what I'm doing. My Valkyrie now matches a 22 GT and I love the GT series. I've always said that a 65 by 47 should have been a 6 by 47. You know, 65 was a little too heavy unless you do the 123. That's what I that's shoot. That's what I shoot for PRS, a 6 by 47. I, yeah. I, I started with a 65 and then I found that the 6 was a better fit. Perfect. And that's exactly how I always thought it should have been. You know, cuz it, it's it's a small case, it's an efficient case, but that 65 was just a touch too heavy. It's what killed the Grendel. 6.5 Grendel should have been a 22 Grendel or a 6 Grendel, but they made a 6.5 Grendel. Or 6. Now they have yeah, a 6, six Arc. Grendel. Yeah, 6 <laughs> Arc, right. If, if the if the 6.5 Grendel was originally a 6 millimeter Grendel, it would have been alive and well. Well, you, you you saw the full transition, right? It, it was yeah. well, it was a 220 Russian, and then the Benchers mm-hmm. guys turned into a 6 PPC. 
Yep. Right. Then Arnie Brennan, whom I, I know, uh, he decided to neck it up to 6'5", change the shoulder a little bit, and called it a 6'5 Grendel. Yeah. Right. And his his purpose was for military use, I believe, you know, AR platform. They used to always show up with it and, and everybody tried it. I mean, I've been through the programs where they've showed up with the Grendels. They've showed up with the uh, um the blackouts. And then even I know when they did the 260 back in 2015, they were running 260s. Like most people think 65 Creedmoor all that they've been running 260s since 2015 uh, right so four but so then you had the six grendel six five mm-hmm. grendel right and yep. now and now now they're calling it the you know they neck it back down now it's a six arc it, it just yep. made a yep. full circle now yes, it's it it's totally <laughs> did and, and and so but it, what it comes down to is they go they're now realizing they went too heavy and they need to go they're backing lighter. it off yeah yes they're backing the weights off because i mean it's why a six millimeter in prs Speed wins. It's out of the gun quicker versus when we were all shooting PRS with a 308, right? The, it, it, so if I make a mistake behind the rifle, if my bullet is out super fast, well, then I got no penalty on the mistake. But if I make a mistake behind the rifle with a 308 with a 175 going 2600, my mistake's going to show up on that bullet. Right. And that's why they're doing that stuff because if the faster I get rid of it, the less chance I'm going to make a mistake. Correct. Yeah, Makes yeah. sense. Makes mm-hmm. absolute sense. So what's next for you? What, 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 what's on the horizon? You got anything else cooking? Yeah, the Chris stuff, um, the way, I mean, we're, we've come on a way of teaching people now that I think is unique. Uh, the Rifle Craft USA, we call it a USA for Universal Skills Assessment. And we've even, like, we can quantify the mental mistakes We'll, we can push you and score you to a point to where we look at what mental mistakes you're making and why and where. Because um, our program, uh, the wind stuff, like next to you, you had that wind meter. We have real-time wind capability now. So we have four of those wind meters for our range. And yeah, the wind zero. Yeah, That's the wind pretty zero. cool stuff, man. It's very cool. Um, so it's reinvigoration just like you were talking about that i i have chris in my backyard we're both hungry and where we can go with this pr- training program and you know even snipers hide i have the app and snipers hide runs really well now you can download the snipers hide app and just go through the form and do all that so i don't have to focus on the website as much anymore it's positioned to just work Mm-hmm. And so that gives me the flexibility to come out on this training side. I mean, I, I work with a lot of other groups. I edit a lot of programs. Like I'll go with CR2, Roberts and Rance. They'll say, hey, we're doing a class in Texas. Come down and sit in. And I sit back and take notes. And I'm like, dude, nobody wants to talk here. You talk about that. You know, you, get rid of that. Because they're coming out of the Army. They were the Army instructors. They had 12 weeks to teach army students how to be snipers. Mm -hmm. Now they're in the civilian world and they have three days to teach you, but they're not always a hundred percent sure what they want to put in there because they've been giving so much to the military. How do they edit it for the civilian? Right. And so they, I go to a lot of these places and I, and like, even with Chris way, there's too many Chris's, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go, I'll go with him and edit his like Chris has drills and he'll do things. But now you have to put it into a class. So I build the classes, you know, and I and I do that with a lot of people. Um, they'll bring me in and I build classes and and say, you know, here's the logical order to present this to the, the civilian world. Here's the logical order to get this result out of a student because I've already tried all these things for the last 20 years. You know, I've already seen the roadblocks and and when people, you know, basically stop listening, the 80, 40, 20, right? I can do 80%. You're going to absorb 40 and then you're going to be able to relate 20 to your buddy. So I know how that works. And and that's kind of what's new with me and just doing that thing and having fun, man, going out and, and just having a blast and being in different places. Yeah, I've uh, I've decided to kind of go the same path. You know, I was a, I was in construction my whole life, and last twenty twenty, I 
we decided no more. I'm going to pursue what I, what really makes me happy, which is shooting and teaching people and, and seeing, you know, their accomplishments with with what I taught them, right? And that yes. that's exciting to me. It's a, it's very exciting to to see people really do well and really get just I don't want to call it hooked, but get get really into it just because they're For not jazz. they are they're not frustrated about x y z right they're they're just excited that they go try something it works now they're telling all their buddies about it now their buddies are excited now they want to try it you know and it just grows the sport you know oh totally and 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 people get it it's infectious you know what i mean because when everybody's leaving people make new friends they realize oh you're only 20 minutes away from me in the class they didn't know that person before now they have people they can work with and you see these communities and connections i mean as much as I rag on a lot of stuff, man. I'm, I'm, I'm opinionated. I say a lot of crap out there that, that people, but it's because I've seen what's been built. And then when you see things sort of get fractured, it's like, why are you doing that, dude? There's enough for all of us. You don't have to be that guy. You can open that door up a little wider and not just let your friends in. And, and so, you know, that's where the opinions go. And people like, well, why do you care about that? It's like, well, we started this. Mm -hmm. I have an interest to see it grow properly. And, and I want to see, I want to sit back 10 years from now on my couch and see something on TV or YouTube, you guys, or whatever the up and coming person is running, gunning on TV and me going, yeah, that guy's doing it right. And I don't want to be some 85 year old guy sitting on the couch going, Look at that freaking jerk. He doesn't even know how to shoot. This whole phase laser rifle, you know, doing all the work for him. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and that's, that's, uh, yeah. You know, very similar to kind of how I feel about, about F class, right? I mean, you know, I started playing F class over, over a decade ago. And, uh, it's been fun. It's, it's, it's still fun, you know, and, and it's, it's what's made it fun for me is very similar to what, you're going through is it's teaching others and and yes. seeing them do it properly you know what i mean um right right and it, that's it's just exciting away the modifiers and, and and making sure people get it and then wherever they go from there it's up to them yeah so tell me about your book is that your oh, book yeah i got the book the precision rifle it's if it keeps falling over on yeah, me but bring anyway, it over go get it go get it i want to see it it's a it's a coloring book <laughs> I, I, yeah, here we go. Here we go. So basically it's there. It's on Amazon and on um, the gun digest published it for me. And what it is, it's sort of like a manual, but it has my story in it. So you get to see like, you know, me at the different schools in the Marine Corps. And so mm-hmm. I mix in, in between, you know, the teaching precision rifle stuff uh, with the, the different, um, deployments and the different stories. And then you can kind of see there's the first, our sniper rifle, uh-huh. our first 50 cal. And, and so, uh, but it has like the different stuff on the website. It has the weaponized math that we came up with. It has, um, when people ask me and they, and I do a class and they say, Hey, do you have your slides? Can you give me this? Give me that. I don't give my slides out, but if you buy the book, everything in my class is in the book. And so it tends to work that way. And um, it's just easy and it worked out. But mainly my main business is the Sniper's Hide, is the website. That's what, where I earn my money. And it allows me to have the freedoms to go out and shoot and train and teach. And that stuff's just the, you know, the gravy, the icing on the cake is is the classes. Um, but we do have the app for, for that. And so it's self-contained. And then we have the live stream built into the app. We have all kinds of neat. All the good stuff. Yeah, we have all the good stuff. All right, I'm going to get your book, and I'm going to read it. You should have said I would have gave you one there. I had them with me. I didn't think. You you, you You give me your address. I'll mail you a signed one. Yeah, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it. Mm-hmm. And then after I'm done with it, we're going to do this again because I want to talk okay. about the book. Because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that I'm going to want to talk about. That's okay. that's yeah, my nature. Yeah. All uh-huh. right, Frank, another thing. Before we go, I always ask my uh my guest to nominate somebody else that i need to talk to because i'm i don't want to get stuck in the bubble of only talking to people that i know which is why immediately the minute i met you i wanted to talk to you because you know you're outside of my what i call bubble right okay so who do you think i need to talk to that you think i would i would be have a 
uh, interesting conversation. Well, you have talked to Way already on your podcast, right? No, I don't think I have. You haven't talked to Chris no, Way? I think oh, you got to get Way on. Um, Way or Roberts? The, but Way would be, I say, for number one because Way's just out there. Um, his scientific method, and I mean, the guy just collects trophies. I think he's got almost all the steel now, except for like one um for okay. these matches uh but chris would be the guy to talk to um uh, mainly because i know he's a fan of yours and, and with that and and he follows a lot of what you do but he is a sponge and the the, the amount of knowledge that guy has is crazy and he, i think his uh like the way he's pushed the community to do things slightly different, like the building breaks on the clock, building basically setting up the tripods for positions, shooting the targets, and then breaking them down. So build a build a position, fire, break it, mm -hmm. and then redo it again. It it's changed a lot of how we train and teach now. Um, it's not where you kind of come running up to a stage and everything's pre-deployed and preset, and you're trying to balance it with, you know all your hands in your pack and everything it's no, your stuff's put away. Deploy it. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah I need well, to talk to him. Way so would be the guy I would, I would put you in touch with. Perfect. Uh, get me in touch with him. And this has been great. Like I said, once I read the book, we're going to do this again. Cause I know I'm going to have questions. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I'm going to send you one. So text me your uh, I will. address. Frank, thank you very much. It's been thank a great you. man. Thank you. Thanks everybody out there. Cheers. Bye-bye.